Welcome everyone to Couch Potato Diary, coming to you from the Clearwater Cleaning Solutions Broadcast Studio, your one-stop commercial and residential cleaning company based out of Calgary, with a fantastic team ready to make your life simpler and easier by fulfilling all of your cleaning needs. Check them out online, clearwatercleaningsolutions.com. You can find me online at Twitter and Instagram, I'm at PrimetimeKlein, twitch.tv slash PrimetimePK. You can email the show, Diary at yahoo.com. Haven't done these video ones as much as I would like, but here we are, uh, unless you're listening in the regular format of podcasting, in which nothing's really changed for you at all uh coming up on the show today things are bleak for the calgary flames things aren't bleak for the toronto maple leafs almost said raptors um and it is a big weekend after what was a big weekend in the world of combat sports last weekend the ultimate fighting championship uh, championship took over this weekend it is professional wrestling's turn it is going to be a fun show we got a lot of previewing to do But before we get into the Fightin' Friday portion on a Saturday, uh, it's time to get into a little bit of Calgary Flames talk. All right, so it is obviously looking very bleak for the Flames after their loss a couple of nights ago, Thursday night, against the Detroit Red Wings. And first of all, uh, when I was on Game Over this week, I... I had a, a couple of Red Wings fans a little upset with me because I was like, you did that against the Red Wings? Look, I think Detroit is a fun team. Um, I think they are right there. And I, I think that we are a year away. And look, the East playoff race is going to be a ton of fun this year. I think we're a year away from this team being really, really, really good. And so for that reason, I um, I, I guess I, I don't want to say, oh, I apologize because I don't particularly care that much. But I, I do... I do kind of feel like I maybe undersold even my feelings on the Red Wings a little bit. And that that certainly was not the case. I think that this is a Detroit team that's a lot of fun. I'm just saying that the resistance that the Flames offered against a team of that caliber was rather underwhelming. You look at it from a Calgary Flames perspective, and that this is a team that, like, if they push you... You should be able to push back with, re- not with relative ease, because again, that's undermining them, but that, that is a team that you shouldn't just one punch and like, ah, well, fuck it, I guess. And that seems like what happened on Thursday. Now they get ready for a game tonight. It's Hockey Night in Canada. It's the New York Rangers. They just acquired a guy in a move that a lot of fans were, I think, at a, a certain points, hoping that the Flames would make that type of a move as well. And now you're in a weird kind of dead spot for the Flames, because I don't think this team is good enough to be giving up first round picks to try to add to this team to try to get yourself over the hump but a i don't think this team has enough sellable options b i don't think they're bad enough that selling even makes a whole lot of sense right now so they are once again in this weird middle ground that the flames have lived in for the last forever so we we will see where it goes but they, they need a strong 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 performance tonight if they want to get this thing back on track because it is a tough schedule as the the people on the video portion of this now just get to watch me look at my phone for a quick second but people have talked about it for the last little bit the the reason that it's been so frustrating for the flames over the, the last little while is because this was supposed to be the time you make up the ground right um red wings senators sabers red wings rangers kraken chicago columbus These are the teams you're supposed to be beating, and they lost to a bunch of them. And now the Flames find themselves in a just absolute death battle for the final playoff spot. And coming up, it's the Rangers, who I think are really good. The Flyers, who aren't, admittedly. Arizona, who's not. But then it's Vegas, Colorado, Boston, Toronto, Minnesota, um, Dallas, Minnesota. That is the stretch for the Flames heading into the trading deadline and then coming out of it. you, You want, like... The, the time for making up ground is over. This is now the, who the fuck are you really? Who are the Calgary Flames? We are pretty sure we know, and we're not happy with the answers. If they want to turn this thing around, uh, they're now going to have to do it against some of the top opposition that the National Hockey League has to offer. And it is going through a time where there's a lot of talk now about what's going on in that Calgary Flames room, right? Because of the, the comments that Alan Walsh made about things being negative. And what's funny to me is, I mean, a couple of things. One, uh, talking with a, a couple of people, not with inside information, but just having the conversation. That this is, I mean, part of this is obviously like Alan Walsh is taking the pressure off of his guy, Jonathan Huberto. And for Huberto, you wonder now if there is some regret about signing that um, extension before even playing a game with Daryl Sutter. And I think part of it for him is, certainly all of it for him, was a bit of security, and it was security for the Flames too. And um, even with 
the particular um, player in question here with Huberto, even with um, him underperforming, I don't think from a flame standpoint, you look at that contract and think, oh, we screwed that up um, because of how this is going. You saw like Kachuk didn't want to be here. Gaudreau didn't want to be here. Now you have a guy who's coming off of a 115 point season who wants to be here. You sign him to that contract 100 times out of 10. I, I don't, I do not hold any part of that contract against the Flames. Nobody saw this coming. Absolutely nobody saw this coming. But for Huberto now, you could see how he wanted the, um, the, the security, right? He, he just got traded from Florida to Calgary. If you're going to make that move, you want to be able to settle instead of Eh, I'll rent, not buy, and I'll just see what's happening at the trade deadline. Because, mark my words, if he had not signed that contract extension, he is toward the top of every trade board that is on right now. And we are having significantly different conversations around this Calgary Flames team and this Calgary Flames franchise if Jonathan Huberto was available. Then we're getting into real start over. And from a Flames, but for, from Huberto's standpoint, I understand all of that. But it seems miserable right now. And I'm wondering if he kind of wishes, boy, I'd like to be able to get out of here in a year. And when you have your agent sending off things like that, and it, it, plausible deniability for Huberto, he can be like, no, I didn't know he was going to say that. Alan Walsh tweets all the time. He's got a podcast. Like, I'm, I don't give a fuck what the guy's tweeting about. Um, so it's plausible deniability. I cannot imagine he is doing that without his client knowing what's going on. And now the thing about that tweet that continues to just kind of rattle around in my brain You've noticed all the discussion around that has been like, oh, did Huberto know? Well, uh, yes, there's uh, this isn't going to affect our locker room. You notice no one's come out and said, ah, no, you know what? Things are actually pretty good here right now. That there has been no one's denied anything. Oh, it's super negative. No, no one's everyone's just been like, oh, well, who knew? Did you know he was going to send out that absolutely truthful tweet? I, I didn't know he was going to send out that 100% truthful tweet. And no, yeah, no one's been like, oh, it's actually not that bad. Everything around that tweet has just been about some of the, the, the outside things and not, oh yeah, it fucking sucks in Calgary right now. This is a Flames team that feels like they're in a lot of trouble at the moment. And now they are going into a stretch where it does not feel like it is going to be easy to get out of it. Moving on from the Calgary Flames to a little bit more hockey talk. The Toronto Maple Leafs pulling off a major trade as they have acquired uh, Ryan O'Reilly and uh, Noel Chari. I'm saying that name completely wrong. Let me... This is all... I want to say live. I mean, obviously, I'm taping all of this and could easily edit it out. No, Noel Achari. I was right. I don't know why I doubt myself. Uh, but Achari and... Um, and Ryan O'Reilly going to the Toronto Maple Leafs in exchange for a whack load of draft picks and uh, a couple of prospects, including, um, it's Adam Gaudet, I believe. But anyway, a whack load of picks, a couple of prospects. They, I love this move for the Leafs. Absolutely could not be more in love with this move from a, a Toronto Maple Leafs standpoint based on like a, a few things going into this one, pulling up the official trade. Uh, it is Adam Gaudet. Uh, so it is Godet, Mikhail, Abramov. Yeah, I got that right. Uh, a first round pick in 2023, a third round pick in 2023, and a second round pick in 2024. And then a fourth round pick goes to Minnesota, who helps with the retention of some of the salary, which is a genius move from, I, I think, from a Toronto Maple Leaf standpoint. I love this trade. I, I think for Toronto, it either extends their depth or what we're seeing is potentially putting O'Reilly with Marner and Tavares. I... Look, is Ryan O'Reilly the player he was even three years ago? No, absolutely he is not. But for A, for $1.8 million or whatever it's going to be for Toronto, doesn't matter. Um, he is a significant upgrade to this forward group. Achari, I think, kind of helps out a fourth line that's kind of needed some help for a little bit out in Toronto. And it, it, everyone's going to kind of latch on to this. Dude's been there before. And he's been there before in a situation where not a whole lot of people expected him to be there before. So... I, I think for a number of different levels for the Leafs, this makes all the sense in the world for for Toronto. And, like, I, I just, I, I love this trade. And really, like, they, they didn't give up anything off of their main roster either to, to do this. And they still have $3 million in cap space. So if they want to go out and make another move, if they, they need goaltending depth with uh, Samsonov 
and uh, Matt Murray dealing with the injury issues that they are dealing with, I think you can absolutely go out and do that. Um, if you, you feel like you maybe need to address the decor a little bit, if you think you need another forward, they can go out and do that. Like th this trade just checked so many boxes for the Leafs and still left a couple of things untouched. It is almost a perfect trade for Toronto. For the Blues now, the sale continues. Tarasenko gone, um, and, and now Ryan O'Reilly and Noah Chari are out the door as well. I wonder what is next out in St. Louis. They have a few young pieces that I don't think are going anywhere, like Thomas and Cairo are going to be part of the, the next wave of this and i think shen's contract is too big and too long to to be moving anyway so for me the attention kind of goes to to barbashev and to buchnevich and bringing this back to the calgary flames conversation i think those are two players that would fit in really really well barbashev scoring 26 goals last year buchnevich i have long liked the potential uh, of that particular player i think it would take a lot to get both of them out of st louis but if you are looking to make a real legitimate splash for this franchise right now and again, dollar in, dollar out basically is where Calgary is at right now. But I think those are a couple of guys who would really be able to impact things. And I think a number of teams should be looking at them. I don't know if they are available, but I wonder if a team misses out on the Timo Meyer sweepstakes, if they can kind of pivot and go the, the direction of a Buchnevich or... Um, or, or a Barbashev or, or those types of players because I, I think those are dudes that can really add to things for your roster. So that is going to do it for all the hockey talk. It is now time for a Fightin' Friday on a Saturday. And we begin with the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Last weekend, it was a battle of the titans as Islam Makashev defends the UFC's lightweight championship against their featherweight champion, um, Alexander Volkanovsky, in a five-round battle. And my main takeaway from this fight is I do feel like Volkanovsky comes away feeling a bit better than Makashev does. I, I thought that the effective offense that Volkanovsky was providing was just quite frankly more fun than that of Islam Makashev. And I feel like I just came away from this fight more impressed with Volkanovsky, the underdog moving up in weight. Makashev, I, I thought like to, to be the champion in that weight class and have the guy coming up to meet you and to be so dominant up to this point, I, I thought it was a real kind of a, oh, Oh, that's interesting. And I don't know if the, the the speed and pace that Volkanovsky can fight with kind of threw off Makashev, who normally can match that of his opponent or what it was. And it, it's weird to say, oh, well, a blueprint's been set now. All you have to be is maybe the most talented fighter in the world. And hey, you got this. So it's, it's tough to, to really say like, well, going forward now, Makashev's in trouble. Unless Volkanovsky moves up and wait again. Um... I don't necessarily think that Makashev is in super trouble at 155 pounds, but he was in trouble in this fight. And I'll be perfectly honest, I had Volkanovski winning this bout, and I don't really know how you can't, to be perfectly honest with you. Round one, Makashev gets dominant position late, although Volkanovski was controlling most of the round, but we'll give that to Makashev. The second round is where you can kind of see things swing a little bit. I have no idea where four of these rounds goes to, to Islam Makashev. But the second round, I thought that Volkanovski clearly was the more effective striker. Makashev had his moments where he landed big a couple of times and he did get a couple of takedowns, but I thought most of the round was controlled by Alexander Volkanovski. And I, I think, well, we'll get to, to, to kind of judging takeaways in a second. Third round goes to Volkanovski. I thought that's when he really started to get into his groove. But then in the fourth round, Makashev starts to, to get a bit more of that control back and it's kind of dominant control. He clearly wins that round. And then the fifth, I thought Volkanovski, I don't want to say styled on him a little bit, but Volkanovski controlled that round. He thwarted basically everything Makashev threw at him, and he was effective in doing it while providing his offense as well. So when you go through these, the second is the only one where I'm like, you know what, I can kind of see where you give that to, to Makashev. And in a fight this close, that is enough on two judges' scorecards to, to give him the win. But I came away from this one with a, a great appreciation still. And you guys know, Volkanovski might be my favorite fighter right now. Um, in, in terms of like, being the best fighter in the world at this point. Like, I, I Israel Adesanya will always have my, my... Well, maybe not always. I shouldn't say that in the fight game. Some of these guys are awful, and who knows? Um, but um, Israel Adesanya, anytime he is fighting, I need to be watching. So, But th there are a few guys who are like that, and Volkanovski certainly, I think, needs to be that. And it was great for him to, to get this big spotlight in Australia. Like, he felt like a superstar all weekend long. All week long, really. And certainly on Saturday night. And I think... This kind of shines, I don't want to say shines a light, because no, 
No one's going to come out of a show and be like, hey, you know what's a little off? MMA judging. What a surprise. But I think this was the only way I can really wrap my head around some of the, the judges' scorecards that we saw and some of the discourse around this is how much people value just moving forward. Because I think that this was an interesting bout in that way because Volkanovski was moving more and I think kind of dictating the, the movement, but... Makachev was the one who was visibly coming forward. And so I think for some people, you can kind of see Makachev, oh, he's on the front foot. Look at him moving forward. He's dictating where this goes. Well, really, he was kind of chasing the whole time. Like, Volkanovski wasn't coming forward, but I think he was leading for most of this fight, if, if that makes sense. I think he was certainly leading the dance. Um, and that's not something I was expecting. With Makachev being as big as he was, I thought he would have a bit more success being able to dictate where this fight was able to go. But I think in the, the eyes of the judges, you see Makachev with that forward movement and oh this guy's moving forward he's clearly dictating and that just simply wasn't the case that there was uh, aside from a couple of quick bangs that Makashev was able to to get off I did not think he controlled any of the feet in the stand-up and quite frankly I thought he looked very uncomfortable in the stand-up against Volkanovsky in this bout and the the one kind of caution I would have for Volkanovsky in moving up and I think it's kind of the same for Figueredo as he now looks to to move up after his four fight bout with Renan Moreno uh, ends in Moreno getting the, the the rather decisive victory in that one. The thing that would concern me a little bit is it's one thing to have guys the same size as you punching you in the head and having your chin hold up, but Volkanovski was not able to walk through the punches from the champion at 155 pounds the way he has been able to walk through punches of guys at 145 pounds before. And part of that is Makashev just hits hard, but I think part of that is he is a bigger human being than Volkanovski has taken punches from in the past. And so th those were the only times where it looked like Volkanovski was really in trouble, and then he was able to, to get things back a little bit. I don't know if that's something you can train. I don't know if that's something your body can get used to, but if he gets away from those... Um, I, I think he has quite a bit of success. There's a couple of little things in this, and again, far be it from me to technically critique the, the guy who I think is the most well-rounded fighter in the sport right now, but there was a couple of times where he just hung out inside too long. Like, he was doing really good at just, like, kind of bop, bop, and move, and quickly bouncing in and out, but there was a couple of times he would bop, 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 and then hang out for a second, and Makashev would either clip him or what would grasp him and uh, get a bit more into the world that Makashev wanted. And so, to me... That this is another case where it felt like the, the the times where Volkanovsky was vulnerable and the times where Makashev had success, it was more what Volkanovsky did wrong than what Makashev did right. The counters were working for Makashev for sure, but I, I think the majority of the time where Makashev had success, it was because of Volkanovsky just having a split second um, somewhere too long. And credit... Makashev for taking advantage of those opportunities because it's not like he just stood there with his, his head down dangling out like th this was certainly um, Makashev taking advantage of those opportunities but those opportunities were presented to him by Volkanovsky I don't think Makashev did anything to create those and all that being said I do think now Makashev moves into the uh, pound for pound number one spot um, it's been an interesting year for that right like I think when you're looking at pound for pound currently I I like, style points, if you're splitting hairs, I think has to come into it a little bit. But I, I think these are the top one and two for me, for pound for pound on the men's side in MMA right now. And I, I think for that, and because of that, you, you have to go with what the result was. You can't just say, ah, oh, I think Volkanovski beat him, so Volkanovski is still number one. Um, you, you, I don't... I don't think in this case you get to do that. I think you have to play the results as they have been handed to you. And because of that, Makashev is, to me, number one in pound for pound. But, man, it's been really interesting in that the, the last 18 months or so, right? You have um, Volkan in no particular order here. You have Volkanovski losing. You have Adesanya and Usman losing their titles. And you have Nganu leaving. Um, you, you have more of the what the fuck is going on at 205 pounds. Um and in each instance, like, I, 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 still, I still view Usman as the better fighter against Leon Edwards. He controlled 24 minutes of that fight, and I think he gets his title back when, when they rematch it. Israel Adesanya, I thought, was controlling a lot of that, and he got caught. And look, that's part of the fight game, right? Um, but I, I don't view either guy who holds the title over guys who could have previously made their claim to the pound-for-pound pound number one as dudes who are markedly better than those two guys. And so if I don't think you're markedly better than the guys in your own division, I can't have you as pound for pound number one. 205 pounds is all over the fucking place with who is uh, number one 
at that spot. And so I, I think it's really interesting, the the pound for pound discussion right now as that kind of continues. Uh, but right now, I think Makashev is the, uh, the clear number one in that spot. There is a UFC card coming up tonight. I have a fancy graphic for fight previews. I'm not going to use it because there is, it, it's just one bout in, in my opinion anyway. But then there's a couple of fun fights like it, uh, Open St. Prue is back on a fight night card and stuff like that. But this one is really all about Jessica Andrade taking on Aaron Blanchfield. Um, it's another title opportunity for Andrade. She is a slight favorite over Blanchfield. Um, an interesting uh, challenge, I think, is Blanchfield. She's never beat anyone on the level of Jessica Andrade, but that's because there's like four women in the world who are on the level of a Jessica Andrade, which is a mark in the favor for Jessica Andrade. But I... Blanchfield with a couple of impressive wins in a row. She's won seven in a row. I can't imagine a scenario coming up where it's not against either Nunez or Shevchenko where I'm picking against Andrade. I just think she is so much better than everyone else who doesn't hold a championship right now um, that it, it's tough for me to, to not go with uh, Jessica Andrade. So I think she gets the job done. We're not doing it today's ticket today, but that is something that I looked at at minus 115 at Bodog. So a uh, portion of Fighting Friday is in the books. Now let's get into what is a great, great epic weekend of pro wrestling with uh, a couple of weekend previews here. All right, um, let's start with the New Japan show. As they are from San Jose, California for Battle in the Valley, a pay-per-view, no less. Uh, it, if you are a New Japan subscriber, um, it, it doesn't matter. You still have to pay for it. And it is also available for us here in North America on Fight TV for, I believe, nineteen ninety nine American. I'm not going to go through every one of these fights because, admittedly, um, New Japan Strong is not a pardon the pun, not necessarily a strong point for me. Um, admittedly, it's a bit of a blind spot. So I'm not going to go through every match here. We'll, we'll mention them anyway. Um, Mascara Dorado, Josh Alexander, Adrian Quest, and Rocky Romero, Rocky Romero, sorry, against Kushida, Volador Jr., Kevin Knight, and the DKC. Again, a couple of names I don't know in there, but it's fun to see Josh Alexander on a, a big card, Mascara Dorado on a, a big card. That should be fun. Fred Rosser taking on Kenta for the strong open weight championship. And these title matches are so weird because I'll, most of it is okay, is Kenta going to win this title and just stay stateside for a bit? Probably not. So I, I think Fred Rosser does um, get a victory in this bout. Um, I understand, like, the want for New Japan to have the the strong titles because this is a, a promotion and a program that they are, I, I think, going to continuously run. I think having the, the IWGP United States Championship would do more for this brand than the strong open weight championship. Like, that, that that's never getting defended on... Uh, Wrestle Kingdom, right? And and so I don't know what Kenny Omega's involvement is going to be with this going forward, if there's going to be any involvement going forward. But the, these ones are always weird because it's, well, who's not going to Japan? Probably Fred Rosser. The open weight tag team titles on the line, the Motor City Machine Guns taking on the West Coast Wrecking Crew of Joral Nelson and Royce Isaacs. I'm, I'm sure they're wonderful people. Now into a couple of the matchups that we are a bit more familiar with. Jay White taking on Eddie Kingston in a Loser Leaves New Japan Pro Wrestling match. Just a couple of days ago, Jay White losing a Loser Leaves Japan match against Hikaleo. All of this amid rumors that Jay White is going to World Wrestling Entertainment. Um, we'll see. Like, Does he pop up immediately on Monday Night Raw tomorrow? To, to set up some kind of a challenge. Is he going to be a SmackDown guy? Is he on WWE at all? Do we see him somewhere else? I don't know where else, but um, I think he clearly loses this. I, I don't think Eddie Kingston is going anywhere when it comes to, to New Japan Pro Wrestling. So I think Jay White loses this one, and I think he is WWE bound. Tom Lawler against Homicide in a Filthy Rules fight, uh, which is no DQ, and the ropes will not be utilized for this match is what they say. I don't, I don't particularly care who wins. Zack Sabre Jr. going up against Clark Connors, someone who was... Um, I don't want to say a bright spot because I, I thought the best of the Super Juniors was actually quite good this year. But Clark Connor, someone who, who got a lot of buzz coming out of that. Interesting match. Zack Sabre Jr. definitely wins this. Now the two matches that everyone is very excited about. 
on this one. The IWGP Women's Championship is on the line as the only belt holder this championship has ever known. Kyrie goes one on one with Mercedes Monet. It is the old Kyrie Sane against Sasha Banks uh, now in New Japan Pro Wrestling. This one, look, as it sits right now on the Wikipedia page and as it sits right now on the, the New Japan World, um, this is the co main event. I think you have to make this one go on last. And it's, look, I am suggesting that one of the great rivalries in the history of professional wrestling not main event with uh, Kazuchika Okada taking on Hiroshi Tanahashi in the main event. But I think because that the, the, because this one perceptually um, stumbled coming out of the, the blocks at Wrestle Kingdom with uh, the, the kind of screwed up move with Monet and, and with Kyrie, or at least the perception that it was a screwed up move. I think that you need to bring a great deal of importance to this, and so I think putting it on last would be really, really interesting. I think you have to go with Monet in this bout as well to, to really make her feel like a, a big deal, and I think kind of pick back up some momentum that you lost when the, the Wrestle Kingdom debut didn't necessarily go perfectly. So I, I'm interested to see how they handle this. If Kyrie wins, it, it's not an absolute stunner to me, but I, I think it'll be very, 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 very interesting to see what Mercedes Monet and Kyrie are able to do. I think it's going to be a phenomenal match, but I think from just kind of building back up the brand equity of Mercedes Monet, um, I, I think you need to give the the artist formerly known as Sasha Banks the IWGP Women's Championship. And then, as mentioned, the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship is on the line as Kazuchika Okada goes one on one with his forever rival Hiroshi Tanahashi. I, I don't think there's a whole lot of drama in what's going to happen in this bout. Um, I, I don't see Tanahashi getting another run with the, um, the, the the heavyweight championship of the world for IWGP. I think Okada wins this one. It'll be a fun match. These two always put on fun matches, but I, I think this one, it's pretty obvious where they are going to go, and that is with Kazuchika Okada retaining the title. Moving up north to Montreal, Quebec, Canada, La Belle Provence. Um, that was an awful French accent, and I apologize greatly for it. This is such an intriguing card on so many different levels. WWE creatively, I think, has been... There's been some flaws, for sure. But I think creatively, like, they have been on a roll right now. This is the most invested I've been in World Wrestling Entertainment in quite some time. And I think there's a few fun things that can come out of this show. Um, the Elimination Chamber match for the WWE United States Championship. They have done a phenomenal job of building the secondary titles back up on SmackDown with the Intercontinental Champion Gunther, um, the Ring General. I love that so much. Um, with him just being an unstoppable force, whoever takes that title from him, it's going to feel like a big deal. Austin Theory has been elevated, and now you have the U.S. title on the line. These secondary titles are feeling much, much more important. It is Austin Theory against Seth Rollins, against Johnny Gargano, against Bronson Reed, against Damian Priest, against Montez Ford in the Elimination Chamber. Um, okay, so who's out? I don't believe Johnny Gargano is going to win. I am fairly certain Bronson Reed isn't going to win. And after that, I think you can make compelling arguments. Austin Theory, to just continue this run, I think is very interesting. I would be surprised if Seth Rollins did win this. Um, I I think that he is going to kind of be... He, he's got his sights on the Paul brothers. And so I, I think because of that now, um, Seth freaking Rollins as the United States champion, uh, probably not going to happen. I, I think you keep that title on someone else. I think Damian Priest, to kind of keep things going with Judgment Day, I, I could see him being victorious in this. There's a lot of people who are ready for a Montez Ford singles run. Um, they have been slow burning this one for a little bit. Montez Ford against Angelo Dawkins at WrestleMania for the United States Championship adds a bit of intrigue to me. I'm, I'm not I'm not going to lie to you. That, that would be pretty interesting. But I, I think we are now ready for a singles run with Montez Ford, um, which is a little unfortunate because the Street Profits are fun, but it does feel like they've kind of topped out. And um, I, I think it's time for some new faces to, to get some run in the tag team division right now. So I, I could see them doing it. My official prediction is is going to be that Austin Theory retains. I don't know what that means for challengers going forward. Maybe it's Jay White. Um, but I, I am fascinated to see what they, they do with this one, but I do think that it is going to be Austin Theory. Uh, Elimination Chamber match for a Raw Women's Championship match at WrestleMania 39. Asuka taking on Liv Morgan against Nikki Cross, against Raquel Gonzalez, against Natalia, against Carmella. Um, I don't see it being Liv Morgan. I'm fairly certain it's not going to be Nikki Cross. 
uh, and I, I don't believe it is going to be Natalia. A quick aside, on the Hart Family thing, phenomenal night at Dungeon Wrestling. You can see uh, behind me, I'm always getting screwed up with the, the camera thing. You can see behind me the, the Bret Hart Shades, Dungeon Wrestling with a phenomenal show at the historic Victoria Pavilion on the Stampede Grounds last night. Uh, Nick Aldis retaining the Stu Hart title in what was a really, really fun night. But I, um, I look at this now as, uh, again, kind of a, a three-horse race in this, with Oscar having a chance, uh, Carmella having a chance, and Raquel Rodriguez having a chance. Carmella, admittedly, a bit of a dark horse, but if they wanted to, to really, like, hey, this is a returning superstar, let's let's build this one up, I think that would be fun. I think it'd be a little underwhelming for WrestleMania, but I, I at least see Carmella having a strong outing here. And so then it comes down to Asuka against Raquel Rodriguez. Um, I could see it being Rodriguez just because they are kind of building her up as this monster, but a, a monster who smiles a lot. Um, and, and I think having her have a dominant win, a la like a Shayna Baszler a couple of years ago in the Elimination Chamber match to get that title opportunity against Bianca Belair, I think would be really fun. And to have um, some of the, the people who were kind of cornerstones of the women's division on NXT <laughs> under Triple H now have like uh, uh, main roles on WrestleMania, I think that would be fun. Not that Asuka didn't have a, ba a main role on NXT. She never lost the NXT Women's Championship. Um, and that's why I think, to me, Asuka is the favorite. No, I mean, that's not really why. But either, I guess either way you have it, um, you, you have proud the, the proud creations of one Paul Levesque on here. But I, I think I look at that era with Bianca, with Raquel, and with, um, with Rhea Ripley, I look at them as kind of the, the same era in kind of a, a post Oscar era. I think Oscar gets the win here. They are building her up as just this like absolute crazy person. And so I could see Oscar getting the win here. And then at WrestleMania 39 mixed tag match, it is edge and Beth Phoenix taking on the judgment day, Finn Balor and Rhea Ripley. I would imagine Finn and Rhea get the win here just to get Rhea moving on up. Um, into her feud with Charlotte Flair for WrestleMania 39. The build for this has been fine. Singles match, Brock Lesnar against Bobby Lashley. Um, I'm interested to see if we get kind of a Gunther against Bobby or, um, Brock Lesnar type of a build and then kind of spiral that off. Uh, Bray Wyatt mentioning Brock Lesnar and Bobby Lashley on Friday. So I wonder if those two kind of spiral off. Um, Brock probably gets the win here. This match will be what it is. And then the match everyone is waiting to see. Roman Reigns against Sami Zayn for the undisputed WWE Universal Championship. We talked about Alex Volkanovsky feeling like a super duper star coming out of uh, the UFC event in Australia. Sami Zayn feels like a big deal. He got his music back and the people lost their shit in Montreal last night. I have no idea how this is going to go. I am so intrigued. I am so invested in this i i just i cannot and i think you can explain any decision let's start with what happens if sammy if sammy wins you have a crowning achievement for a canadian superhero in montreal um a history that or a place that has not had maybe the best history for crowning achievements for canadian wrestlers in the past but you have sammy Zayn in montreal um get this opportunity and if he is the one who vanquishes Roman Reigns on the road to WrestleMania, then holy smokes, what a what a role that would be. Um, the, the issue for that, like well, we're going to kind of go pros and cons here. The, the pro is obvious. It's a star-making night. You've made Sami Zayn forever. You have one of the, the great moments of the last 25 years in professional wrestling if you do Sami Zayn winning the title at Elimination Chamber in Montreal. The crowd will be amazing and it will be fantastic. And then you will go to WrestleMania and it will be Sami Zayn against Cody Rhodes for the WWE Universal Undisputed Championship of the Universal World. The the one thing where I kind of have a bit of a huh about the in terms of a con is I think all of this is building to have Cody be the guy. All of this is building for Cody Rhodes to have his WrestleMania moment to get the um, to, to get the undisputed Universal Championship, uh, the the WWE title that it evaded his father many many moons ago, and we are culminating all of that at WrestleMania for the ultimate feel good moment to I think usher in quite frankly a new era in WWE. I, I think that would be the official like real here it is start of the the Paul Levesque era. Um, 
Although, would it not be fitting then to have Sami Zayn be that because he has been the greatest creation of this up to this point? But I think to go from feel good moment to then feel good moment the next month is just. It, it seems a bit like bang bang, like oh man, we have this feel good once in a lifetime moment. What's next? A feel good once in a lifetime moment. It feels a little quick, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing it in any way. Well, I guess I am kind of criticizing it, but it, it feels like something they would not do. The pros of Roman winning it are you set up the biggest WrestleMania match you possibly can, given the characters involved, um, with Roman Reigns going one on one with Cody Rhodes. Um, I, I think that that, like, from a star power, from just putting it on the poster, and I think from a match perspective, that would be great. And just getting ready for Elimination Chamber tonight and watching the promos with Paul Heyman against Cody Rhodes and that promo battle talking about Dusty. Like, how, how do we not get that paid off with Roman against Cody? How, how, how does that not happen? Um, I don't think we get a WrestleMania 10 with uh, two title defenses, even though there's two nights. I, I, don't, I don't really see that being a thing. I, I think, well, we'll see. But like, pros-wise, Roman getting the, the win here, um, like, it, it just, it sets you up for your biggest match at WrestleMania. The con for Roman winning is, um, it, it just, it takes away from an amazing moment. And you have built up Sami Zayn into this great thing. And the culmination of this great Sami Zayn story being um, Sami Zayn, loses to Roman, and then he and Kevin Owens go for the tag team titles at WrestleMania. It feels a bit, eh, okay. You know, like, it, where one is a major star-making night, the other is kind of a, oh, okay, Sami Zayn's back to where he was. Uh, well, maybe a, a bit elevated from where he was before. So it, it just kind of feels like it, it. it is an unsatisfying conclusion to what has been a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal story. Um, there's a few ways I think you can go about this and still still have Sammy win and still have Cody um, versus Sammy feel like a big deal at WrestleMania. I think it would take away, obviously it would take away from it a little bit. If we're still doing the rock, um, having the, the rock come out and set up something with Roman Reigns where it ends up costing Roman the title and Sammy gets the win. Um, I, I could absolutely see that or stone cold or John Cena or whatever. If you are going to spin Roman reigns off out of that direction into something with the rock or into something that is bigger, that doesn't need the universal championship can totally see that. And you can still, you can kind of do it the way Eddie got his title win where there is obvious Goldberg interference, but Eddie gets the big final move. Like the, the rock hits the rock bottom Roman staggers to his feet. And then it's the, the Huluva kick for the the victory you could you could see that happening um to to kind of build that up obviously a, a kevin owens return um I, I think we just get at some point whether it's him coming out to um to embrace sammy in the ring at the end of the show or uh, you you can't heal kevin owens to a quebec crowd um if it's to get revenge on roman reigns if it's to set up a tag team title match like there's just oh there's so many possibilities i have no idea where they are going to go i I think at the end of the day, they stick to their plan, and it's Roman against Cody at WrestleMania 39 in the main event. You are potentially setting up to all of a sudden heal Cody a little bit. Um, would it be a bit of a cop-out to have Sammy in, like, a triple threat? I don't know, maybe. Um, we'll see. Like, there's just so many different ways that this could go. This would be such an interesting pivot. And one of the things, I, I think, a, a challenge that Paul Levesque has created for himself, but I think such an interesting challenge tonight. I just, oh, I can't wait for how this is all going to play out in a few hours' time. So that is going to do it for the program today. Thank you all so much for downloading and for listening. Thank you to Clearwater Cleaning Solutions, your one-stop commercial and residential cleaning company based out of Calgary with a fantastic team ready to make your life simpler and easier by fulfilling all of your cleaning needs. Check them out online, clearwatercleaningsolutions.com. Uh, they are the studio sponsor for Couch Potato Diary. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, I'm not going to be able to watch these shows live tonight, but I am hoping at some point early tomorrow to have some kind of a, a reaction video out for them. So, yes, thank you all so much for downloading, uh, for listening, for those of you on YouTube, for watching, and I will talk to you all later. Have a great day, everyone, and enjoy what is going to be a phenomenal, phenomenal weekend.